Hey, Guy from New Plastic, and I think it's time to do a deep dive into AOVs. First off, feel free to check out the latest procedural concrete and plaster pack on my Gumroad with over 60 procedural concrete and plaster materials. It's actually one of my favorite packs. Also consider supporting on Patreon or membership where you can get lots of cool perks and project files. All links are in the description. So I had already made a similar video back when Octane was using the multiple pass system. And since that video is now irrelevant because Octane dropped that system and moved into AOVs, I feel like I had to make another video. This time we'll go over almost every single AOV and understand what it is and what it's good for to the best of my understanding. Follow me on Instagram at ojang, like, share, subscribe, bell, buy local products if you can to support the people around you. Let's go. So I have this scene here with all these different objects with a bunch of different materials on them. I have one large soft light here from the left and an indoor HDRI lighting and also have a sky object with this solid gray color set on visible only so it doesn't affect the lighting and is only there as a backdrop. So the AOV section is located in your render settings in the Octane Renderer section and here we have the Render AOV Group tab. First thing you need to do is to check Enable, otherwise it won't work. Next you want to choose the location where you want your AOV files to be saved, probably in the main render folder of your project. One thing I noticed that is really important to remember is that for some reason, having a local path won't work. The file just won't save. I'm not sure why, but that's how it is. So make sure you write the absolute path of your location on your drive, which means starting from your drive letter and cascading down to your render folder. Local paths look like this and absolute paths look like this. Also, it's really important to name your AOVs different than your main beauty render, otherwise they will overwrite it. I usually use the name of my beauty render and add underscore molt or underscore AOV to it. Next is the format, depth and compression. I usually just leave it like this. Make sure your format is set to EXR Octane, otherwise stuff like crypto mats aren't going to render right. Uh, not sure what show passes is, nothing about it in the documentation. I just leave it checked. Check and save beauty will include the beauty render inside your AOV files. I usually leave it unchecked and use the regular beauty render as its own separate file. Checking multi-layer file will combine all your AOVs into a single file that you can then extract your individual AOVs from in your compositing software. I always leave it checked because, for example, if I have an animation with a thousand frames and 10 AOVs, I end up with 10,000 different files and that's just too messy. So I keep it as a single file. If denoise beauty is checked, the EXR file of your AOVs will also include a denoised version of your main render. It's not checked by default, but I like to keep it checked so I can mix the beauty and the denoise beauty manually in post. If you're opening an older file from before Octane introduced AOVs and was still using the render passes system like I showed in my old tutorial, you can convert your passes here to AOVs. I tried it and it can get kind of buggy and miss some passes so make sure you go in manually and add whatever was missing. Okay so this is where you can manage your AOVs. If we click on it we get this window with all the possible AOVs on the left side. Oh, by the way, once your AOVs are enabled, you will be able to see each one in the live viewer window down here. Okay, so let's go over each one of these. To add an AOV to your scene, double click on it. When you click on the AOV you added, you can see the details here. So for example, for the crypto mat AOVs, we have this drop down menu for the type where we can choose what will be used to separate the crypto mats. A material node will give you a different mat for each unique material used in the scene. So object with the same materials will be merged into one mat. The problem with this type is that every time you render you'll get a different colored mats. So for example if you have already rendered everything but realized you had to render again a few frames that got messed up, your crypto mats on those frames will have a different color for each mat. Which sucks for compositing but you can choose to separate the mats by different material names, different object IDs and so on. I would recommend using geometry node name but you should read more into crypto mats and learn more about the different ID types. The live viewer is inactive so let's render the scene and now you can see down here we have more tabs here at the bottom we can click through them while it's rendering without interrupting the render the first one is obviously your main beauty render then the second one is the denoise beauty render which looks pretty much the same because the max samples is set pretty high then we have the noise channel which is added automatically if you have adaptive sampling turned on in your kernel settings this gives you a green gray map that indicates the noise level in your scene if you want to know more about it uh, look into adaptive sampling and the next tab is the CryptoMat AOV, which we added, which in the newer versions of Octane 
actually shows you the different mats, uh, in our case, based on unique materials used in the scene. You can see this includes opacity information as well, since this material has this opacity map on it. On this cube, though, you can see that it gives us a solid mat, even though the material is transparent. Overall, a great and crucial AOV I always use. Okay, next is the iridance channel. This is sort of like a clay rendering output, simply showing you all the objects the light touches in your scene, including reflections. I never use this, but I can see uses for it. Next is light direction. This gives you an RGB image that reflects the X, Y, and Z directions of the lights in your scene. This can be used for complex relighting or lighting adjustments in post or even other 3D programs. Noise is the same as this noise map we already went over. You can render it as an individual AOV. It can help in complex denoising in post. Post processing gives you an isolated channel of your post effects, bloom, glare, and all that. You can see that if I go and change the post effects, it shows in the AOV in real time. The shadow AOV is one of my most used ones. It gives you an isolated view of all the shadows in your scene. This also works with transparency and is greatly affected by the fake shadows options. I accidentally turned on and off the effect alpha option because I'm an idiot. But if the fake shadows option is turned off, you'll see much more shadows in your transparencies. You can also see how shadows on transparent materials are colored if the transmission channel has a color. Again, I use this all the time. Diffuse gives us all the materials that use an albedo channel channel so no transparent objects and no metals will show this material has an albedo channel but it's fully metallic so it won't show and these materials are transparent materials so they won't show either diffuse direct does the same thing except it only gives us the first light bounces coming from the lights so you can see the difference in the main diffuse. We have every single light bouncing in the scene, including reflected lights, but the direct channel does include the reflected lights. Diffuse indirect, however, gives us only the reflected light. So it's missing the first light ray from the lights, but showing only the secondary bounces of the rays from the surrounding objects. One thing to note is that lights coming from emissive materials are considered secondary bounces, so this red cylinder that's emitting light is not showing in the direct channel. In this case, the emission is in the medium channel, but it's the same even if it's coming from the main emission channel. Diffuse filter gives us an non-shaded image of all the albedo channels, same as the main uh, diffuse AOV, but a flat image without specular highlights or shadows. Okay, Octane crashed, but we're back. So the next one is emitters. This will show only a light emitting material or a light object. So you can see the red light emitting cylinder, and if I drag the light object in, you can see it as well. This won't show sunlight or HDRIs. Environment will show the sky object. Right now there are two sky objects, one with an HDRI and one with this gray solid color. And that's what it's showing. If I hide it, you can see the HDRI sky. Reflection shows all the specular highlights reflected from all the materials. Reflection filter shows only the specular channel without any lights and shadows. So this object has a metallic red specular and this object has a light gray metallic specular. The rest have the specular channel set as one, so it's showing white. If I slowly turn this one down, for example, you can see how it gets darker and darker. Reflection direct only shows the first light bounce on the specular reflection. Reflection indirect only shows the secondary light bounces that are reflecting from other objects onto the specular reflections. Refraction shows only the refractive materials, the transparent materials that are set to specular transmission. So you can see that this yellow material here, even though it has transmission, it's not showing it since it's set to diffuse type. So light is not being refracted, only transmitted. Refraction filter shows the float value of the transmission channels set to specular type. I was trying to turn down the transmission channel to show you the effect until I realized I'm on the wrong material. But yeah, as I turn down the transmission value, you can see how it's getting darker and darker. Subsurface scattering only shows material with subsurface scattering with transmission type set to specular. And it shows you the albedo or scattering color. So you can see, uh, no SSS here. Here, this red material, we have a medium, but the transmission is set to diffuse. So it's not gonna show it in the SSS AOV. But that's what the transmission AOV is for. This will show us the transmission channel only, 
also when it's affected by SSS. Transmission filter will show us the value or color of the transmission channel set on the fuse type. No specular, no shadows. So you can see on the cylinder, we have this noise in the transmission channel. And on this yellow material, it gives us the light yellow color from the transmission channel. Okay, I added this cloud object I quickly created with the new pyro system in Cinema 4D. It's actually amazing. RIP X particles, Loki. Let's keep going. The next AOV is volume. This will show us all the VDB objects in the scene. And you can see that it kind of picks up the opacity levels. So if I turn down the density, you can see how it affects the AOV. Volume emission shows only the emission from the VDBs. In this case, we have no emission information in the VDB, so it's not showing anything. Volume mask gives us a black and white mask of the VDB. Volume Z depth front and Z depth back give us a gradient mask of the front and the back of the VDB. If we click on it and then click this arrow here, you can adjust the distance of the Z depth. We don't have a lot of depth in the scenes, so it'll be hard to tell. So let's jump into this other scene with the VDB filling up the whole screen. I also have a cube inside the VDB for reference. So if you look at the Z depth front, you can see the gradient getting brighter as it goes deeper into the space. We can adjust the depth max for different scales of depth. So higher will give us a longer gradient, which will capture a larger depth. Now, one issue is we're getting these black chipping artifacts. It's almost impossible to track down the source of it. It's really frustrating and kind of shows how unreliable VDB workflow still is. One thing I noticed is that it has to do something with the light hitting it. So if we take the light source further away, we get slightly more of those artifacts. And if we bring the light closer to the object, you can see we don't really get them anymore. It's not perfect for obvious reasons. One is that this slight change will affect everything else in your scene. And two is that we still get a little bit of those artifacts. Another thing I noticed is that the higher you, your max samples are, the more artifacts you'll get. So if I increase the samples, you can see we're starting to get them again pretty aggressively. So if you're depending on it, maybe the only way is to render your scene again with altered lighting and lower max samples and use the render only for its volume Z depth AOV. We don't see these artifacts as much in the Z depth back, which gives us a gradient, but kind of like from the inside of the VDB. So you can see the cube inside the volume here, uh, with this part being the very back of the volume, getting darker and darker to this front side of the volume. Either way, you get this really harsh Elias dithering effect on the edges that doesn't sit perfectly with the volume itself. So I wouldn't count on this AOV for any extreme post editing. Okay, back to our scene. The next AOV is custom AOV. This allows us to extract very specific objects or even nodes from our render into its own mat. If we expand it, we can assign up to 20 different custom mats. If we take a look at the AOV, we can see Octane shows us everything in the scene. It seems like Octane assigns every object custom one by default. Uh, to assign a custom AOV to a specific object, add an Octane tag to it and in the object layer tab, you can assign a custom AOV number to it. You can see no matter if I add custom one or change the object color, everything counts as custom one. So I just start from custom two. Now we have to choose the same number in the AOV manager. And now you can see we isolated this object. We're getting a mat of the object and its reflections, which actually shouldn't happen by default. I think this is a bug. Uh, in this drop down menu here, I can select which parts to include in the mat. So I can say include reflections only, refractions only, or include both. By default, it adds none of those. So so you get a mat of the object only, which now you can see it works like it should. But it's cool that you can add all the reflections and refraction as well and adjust them as well in post. Now, an even cooler thing you can do with this is to isolate specific nodes. Let's get rid of the octane tag and go into the material of this cloth object here. We have this image acting as an opacity map and we also have this circular gradient as an albedo map. Inside the custom textures menu, we actually have a capture AOV node. And if we pass the albedo node through it, we can assign this node here a custom AOV. So if I select number two, you, we can see that uh, we don't see anything. I tried to figure out what was happening, but I just needed to re-render the scene and now it works. I'm using Octane 2020, which is still beta. So it's more buggy than usual, but okay. Now you can see we're getting only the albedo channel of this object without any other nodes. There's a tiny bit of artifact from the opacity channel that goes away once we remove the opacity. Maybe checking the effect alpha will fix it. Nah. 
but yeah i still find it extremely useful and again you can add the reflections as well okay next we got global texture this adds a texture to everything in the scene right now we don't have one so we don't see anything but if we click on this arrow here we can add stuff here an rgb spectrum will work and show the color and we can also include the environment which will also add it to the sky and we can also add an image which will use the AOV maps of the objects to wrap around them. Denoiser Remainder gives us the denoised image for only the SSS and transmission materials, which are usually much noisier than the rest of the image. Super useful. I use it a lot. Denoiser Diffuse Direct gives us the first light bounces on the denoised diffuse channels. Denoise Diffuse Indirect gives us the secondary light bounces on the denoised diffuse channels. Denoiser Reflections Direct gives us the first light bounces on the denoised specular channels. I use this AOV all the time. Denoiser Reflections Indirect gives us the secondary light bounces on the denoised specular channels. I use this AOV all the time as well. Denoiser Emissions gives us all the denoised emission channels. Denoiser Volume gives us the denoised volume objects. For this one, you need to enable denoised volumes in the Camera Imager tab in your Octane settings. Generally, none of these denoised AOVs will work without enabling the AI denoiser. And denoised volume emissions will give you the denoised emissions of your VDBs, which we don't have any in the scene. Okay, AO will give you the ambient occlusion in your scene. If we click on the arrow, we can adjust the distance of the AO. Larger distance fits scenes of larger objects and smaller distance fits scenes with smaller objects. As you can see, it accentuates all the crevices and small detail. Alpha shadows honestly makes no visible difference. It's supposed to allow AO to account for transparent and opacity materials, but I really can't tell the difference. Even toggling other alpha settings like effect alpha, I think this has more effect on the direct lighting kernel, but for the life of me, I never can see any real difference with alpha shadows turned on. Uh, bump and normal mapping allows AO to account for the bump and normal maps in the material. If we zoom in, you can kind of see how there's AO in the tiny bump map scratches. And without it, after the noise is gone, the AO only calculates the geometry, so it's fully white. Baking group IDs creates color mats according to the bake ID number for each object. You can set a bake ID number by adding an octane tag and in the object layer tab, you can change the bake ID here. So you can see how each ID number gets a different color that you can then separate and post. Diffuse filter info is the same as the regular diffuse filter we looked at before. The main difference is that this AOV and it doesn't take volumes into account. The other diffuse filter will be masked by any VDB in the scene, but this AOV completely ignores any volumes as if there are none in the scene. Index of refractions shows a grayscale value that represents each material's IOR channel. You can see how most of them are around 1.3, have this dark gray color. And as I increase the IOR of a material, it gets brighter and brighter. In the case of metallic materials, it's representing the metallic IOR. Light pass ID gives us mats for each emitter according to its light pass ID. If I bring in the area light, you can see both the cylinder emitter and the area light are colored the same because they're both assigned light pass ID 1. If I go to the area light tag and change the ID number, it'll have a different color. Material ID will create different mats for every unique material in the scene. This is kind of similar to what a material based crypto mat does, but crypto mats are a newer technology that is generally considered more versatile and more capable when it comes to compositing. I would stick to crypto mats unless you have a really good reason not to. The Motion Vectors AOV contains motion information for adding motion blur in post compositing. Let's jump to this scene where I have these two cubes moving left and right and up and down. I have motion blur enabled in the camera tag and an octane tag on each object. Because we have the Motion Vectors AOV added, octane disables the motion blur in the render because it's assuming we're going to add it in post. If we look at the Motion Vector AOV, the first frame is empty because there is no movement. However, once we go forward, the cubes get a color that represents their movement direction. This bright orange for movement to the right, dark magenta for movement down, teal for movement to the left, and bright green for movement up. The colors don't represent the position of the cube, only its direction of movement. So objects can be placed all over the screen as long as they're moving to the same direction, they'll have the same color. 
and you got a combination of these colors if the movement is combining two direction at once again super useful if you're trying to do a high quality motion blur in post there are special plugins for that that can use this aov okay let's go back to the other project and look at the normal aovs normal geometric gives us an rgb representation of the global normal coordinates of your scene so every polygon is colored by the direction it's facing x axis is red y axis is green and z axis is blue this aov ignores fong smoothing so you can see it's all faceted normal shading is doing the same thing except it's taking into account micro imperfections from the bump in normal channels in the material look at all this detail we have here from the bump map that we don't have in the normal geometric aov also this includes funk smoothing i use this aov all the time as it allows certain control in the 3d space in post compositing normal smooth is doing the same as geometric except it includes funk smoothing normal tangent is using local space instead of global space you can see each bump is colored in rgb relating to the object space itself instead of the whole object getting the rgb normal color if you don't understand the difference between local and global normal space uh, you should read about it object id creates mats colored by different object ids by default they are all id1 and these blue and yellow objects already have an octane tag with different ids assigned to them if I add an octane tag to this object and change it to ID2, it will automatically assign a different color to it. It doesn't matter if I change the bake ID, layer ID, instance ID, or even object color, it'll automatically assign the object a different color. It's important to note that if an object has multiple meshes merged in it, it will assign each mesh within the object a different color. Object layer color is using the object color in the octane tag to create mats. So each mat will be colored the object color it has in the octane tag. Opacity is using the value in the opacity channel of the materials. So you can see almost all the materials have full opacity, so they're all white, except the cloth with the reaction diffusion pattern. If I add a noise to the material of this rock object at the top, and it's a little buggy, so let me refresh the render. And yeah, now you can see this noise in the opacity AOV. Position assigns RGB colors to the global position of each vertex in the scene. The XYZ position in the scene in relation to the camera dictates the hue and the value of the color. Even though I don't use this AOV, it can be really helpful for complex relighting of your scene in post or in other 3D programs. Reflection filter info and refraction filter info do the same as reflection filter and refraction filter, but again, and not including the volumes in the scene. Render layer ID assigns different mats based on the layer ID number in the octane tag. Render layer mask has to do with post compositing using the AOV node system in octane. We'll touch on that a bit later. Roughness gives us an unshaded value of the roughness channel of each material. So you can see the material of this pyramid at the bottom has a noise attached to the roughness channel and that's what we see. If we had a float value, it would give us the gray value of that float number. Tangent texture gives us the normal directions of the U coordinates in each object based on its UV maps. The U and UV represents the horizontal coordinates of the texture. Again, used for advanced 3D compositing, relighting, and also for debugging, diagnosis of scenes, and other stuff that unfortunately I'm too dumb to explain. Transmission filter info does the same as transmission filter, but again, and not including the volumes in the scene. UV coordinates give us, surprisingly, the UV coordinates of each object in the scene, with 0, 0 coordinates being black, 0, 1 being green, 1, 0 red, and 1, 1 yellow. Wireframe gives us the triangulated wireframe of every mesh in the scene. Z-depth gives us a 2D black and white gradient that follows the depth of the scene. If the map is fully white, we can click on this arrow here and increase the Z-depth max until we start to see the depth representation. There's not a lot of depth in this scene, but you can see that things that are closer to the camera are darker and things that are further away are brighter. Since we don't have any geometry behind our objects, only a sky, the background is too dark. To fix that, we can adjust the environment depth. Now you can see we get a full gradient from dark to bright and depends on how deep our scene is, we can adjust the depth max. 
This AOV is extremely useful for creating depth of field, adding fog, separating objects amongst other uses in post compositing, and I use it a lot. Just remember, it doesn't include any volumes in the scene. Light isolates each light source in our scene. By default, it's set to sunlight, which we don't have here, but we can select other sources like ambient light, which is the light coming from the sky object, like the HDRI. You can see that here, the lights coming from the area lights and the emitting cylinder aren't active. We only get the light coming from our HDRI. If we set it to light ID 1, we get all the lights assigned to ID 1, which by default are all the emitters and light objects added. In this scene, only the red cylinder is assigned to light ID 1. Our area light is assigned ID 2. If we change to 1, we'll also get it in this AOV. Or we can set it to ID 2 and select light ID 2 in the AOV. So we'll only get that light isolated. I use this a few times. It's very helpful if you really want to dial in or be able to adjust the light color and strength in post compositing after you've already rendered everything. Light Direct acts the same way, except only giving us the first light rays bouncing from the object. Light Indirect gives us the secondary light ray bounces of the selected lights, so not the light coming from the light source, but the light from the light source that reflected off the materials. And finally, these layer AOVs have to do with the render layer process, which honestly will take a whole video to explain, so I don't want to get into it right now. I only used render layer a couple of times in my life when I had to add CG to live footage. It's not that complicated, but it's a whole process to explain. Okay. That covers pretty much all of the different AOVs. Now let's go over a few last things. In the main AOV tab, there are a couple more things. Like I said, Denoise Beauty, I always turn on to get a separate Denoise Beauty pass. In the parameters channel, turning on raw will export all the beauty AOVs, diffuse, reflection, refraction, etc. as raw AOVs, which basically means they are ignoring the tinting that's happening on the surface of the object. This results in a more, for lack of a better word, neutral image that can then be multiplied over other passes and post and adjust colors and lighting without affecting the original image as much. It's meant for extremely flexible but also extremely detailed and laborious post compositing. Crypto mat bins and seed factor basically refer to the quality of the crypto mats. These numbers are multiplied to create the final output and honestly just don't change them unless you really know what you're doing. Only thing I would touch is the max info samples, which controls the samples dedicated to the crypto mats, but I never needed more than 128. So actually just again, unless you really know what you're doing, don't touch it. Info sampling method set to distributed rays tells crypto mats to include motion blur, depth of field, and pixel filtering in your mats. Non-distributed with pixel filtering won't include motion blur and depth of field, but will include pixel filtering. And the last option won't include any of them. Pixel filtering is pretty much anti jittering and anti-aliasing. So again, unless you really know what you're doing, just leave it as distributed rays. Info opacity threshold tells the crypto mats the minimum amount of opacity a material has to have before excluding it from the mats. Okay, last thing I want to go over is the AOV node system. In theory, this is great. This basically allows you to do post compositing using the AOVs inside Octane without needing a compositing software. So if we go into it, we can see all the nodes that represent our AOVs that are attached to the general renderer node. That means they're active. On the side menu, you'll find all the AOV related nodes down at the bottom of the list. You can drag a compositing AOV node from here, uh, or actually better yet, you go to the renderer node and in the AOV group tab, you click add input and that will add a general composite AOV output node. Now here we can click on add input and select which AOV we want to composite. So I'll quickly add a shadow reflection and the beauty pass. Let's put the beauty pass at the bottom. Now we have the shadow at the top, reflection in the middle and the beauty pass at the bottom. And now we can blend them together just like in the composite texture node. If I go to the output tab, you can see how they all look blended. Looks pretty bad. I found that changing the alpha operation to alpha compositing looks much more like what you're probably used to in blending layers. If I disconnect the shadow layer, now you can see that the reflection layer is blended using add mode. Now I can change the opacity just like I would in After Effects. And if we plug the shadow layer, change to alpha compositing, and blend mode to multiply, we get the shadows multiplied. I can change the opacity and also I can add a AOV color correction node and adjust the exposure or contrast of the AOV. 
I don't know, maybe this system is superior in some ways, but I'm so used to just exporting all the AOVs and doing this compositing, mixing and After Effects that I find this way a bit sluggish and inefficient. But if you don't have any compositing software or never worked on one, maybe this is the way for you. Maybe it's worth uh, exploring it. Next tutorial, I might go over how to actually composite all these AOVs in post. I did that in a previous video that used the old passive system. The compositing part in After Effects isn't affected, so that second part of that video is still relevant, but maybe it's worth revisiting that process with uh, maybe more stuff in it. Till then, check out the latest procedural concrete and plaster pack on my Gumroad. Consider supporting on Patreon if you can, and that's it. Big hug to my phenomenal patrons and members, Emmanuel Omelas, Yin and Gong, Guillaume Lopez, Dave Toro, Marie Robbins, Svoyas Chari, Eric Hu, Daniel Larry, Minky Kim, Adder, Jamie Nix, Leo, Miskik 2S, Peter Rodiger, Yan Ji Shin, Chris Hyde, Alda Boyd, Fanrong Fanrong, Katie Royal, Derek Fredrickson, Rasmus Holmquist, Asaf Goldstein, 3D Monkey Biz, Arlen, Suki Violet Sue, The 22 Design, Joel Rieger, Adrian Desole, Derek Schultz, Maurice Sikendorf, Estudi Image, Matus Jedrzejewski, Blue Hamel, Mark Cragen, Joshua Akoy, Punxsacornium Siri, Webb, Kong Idiot, Maddie DeGuelre, Cho Injun, NZE, IMN, Golfino666, Ali Asser, RDM, Mouse from Next House, Rom30, Leandro Merriman, May, Baugasm, Shane, Perry Cooper, Big Max, MyZDD, and everybody else on the list. I love you. Have a great day. Peace.